dealing with temptation. Now, if you have been in the church or if you have been a Christian for some time, you would agree with me that the subject matter is not new. You see, as we walk with the Lord, we will experience temptations and trials or the testing of our faith. And I think it will be very, very helpful when we are going through any of these situations to know, A, what kind of experience is this? Is this a trial or the testing of my faith? Or is this a temptation? Because we, the way we deal with these, we deal with them differently as you would see. And it's also important that we know what, how we got into that situation. And that will help us to make a clear distinction. Is this a testing, a trial of my faith, or is this a temptation? James chapter 1, I'd like to read from verse 2. It says, Consider it pure joy, Brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So, I'd like to start by talking briefly about trials, the testing of our faith. Now, when we are tried, the testing of our faith, so the subject matter is about our faith. Because if you read there, it says it stated clearly there. It says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So in other words, the testing of our faith or trials is a process that results in growth. And when I mean growth, I mean spiritual growth. The growing of your faith And when we are being tried, it feels like we are in the wilderness. When, we are being, when our faith is being tested, that's the time you, you struggle and you sometimes wonder. We sang earlier on that he has done great things. And in times like that, you wonder, where is God who has done great things? But you see, that's the time to re-echo it to your spirit. That we forget not his benefits. When we remember what he's done in the past. And knowing fully well that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then, in the midst of the difficulty, we can sing that indeed he has done great things. Praise the Lord. Because we know the end product of the situation we are going through, and that end product is what? Growth, maturity, and completeness. And when we get to that point, the Bible says we lack nothing. 
we lack nothing. In verse 12 of the same James chapter 1, it says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Having stood the tests, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. It's not pleasant when our faith is being tested. But why is it that we have our faith tested once in a while. I'd like to make it clear here, very clear, that we come to faith through Jesus. And when you give birth to a child, you want your child to grow. If after 10 years your baby is still crawling, there is a problem. If after 10 years your baby is still wanting to take breast milk, then you have a situation in your hands. And it's the same thing with God, our Father. God does not want us to be crawling after we've been Christians for 10 years. God wants us to make progress. And hence, he occasionally allows, occasionally allows the testing of our faith. God wants us to grow, to grow. And so when our faith is being tested, we become patient. As we are being patient, we are persevering, we are waiting, we're trusting God, asking him to help us in the place of prayers, in the place of exercise and stretching our faith. We're told it leads to maturity. And there is a blessing in persevering on that trial. The Bible says that that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, I said earlier on, God allows our faiths to be tested once in a while. Now, I'm going to read from Job, chapter 1. This is a very clear example of a man in Scripture who was tested. He was tried. The Bible says in, chapter, in Job 1, chapter, verse 1, it says, In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Please remember that. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when a period of feasting had drawn its course, God, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them. I'd like to pause here and say something. Job believed in the provisions of making animal sacrifices in the Old Testament for the cleansing of sins. To me, as a man who had faith, absolute faith in God, and he did not want anything at all to come between him and God, he did not want his children to come between him and God, the sins of his children to come between him and God. And so Job would say, paradventure, just in case, while they were partying, drinking and dancing and eating and whining, they may have said something, sinned against God. He would sacrifice, the Bible says he would sacrifice for each of his children. That is faith. 
and this was Job's regular custom. One day the angel came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth, going to and fro on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Why did God remember Job? There were thousands, I'm sure, millions of people on earth. But the Bible says, God asked Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Because God, A, was pleased with Job, and B, Job had faith in God. The Bible says what? That without faith, it is impossible to please God. When we please God, God is pleased with us. And the only way we can please God is not by our human efforts. It's by the Holy Spirit and true faith in God. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Again, the same testimony. People on earth, they knew Job as a man that was blameless and feared God. God knew Job as a man that was blameless and feared him. The same identity, singular identity before God and before man. How do people see you? How do people see me? Do I have a different identity at home? Do I have a different identity at work? Do I have a different identity in church? Brothers and sisters, it shouldn't be like that. One identity. The way God sees you should be where your fellow brothers and sisters, your family members see you. Praise the Lord. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge of fence around him and his household and everything he has? So you have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are separate throughout the land, are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and it will surely cause you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then. Everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So we can see here what is, what's going on there. First of all, Job has done nothing wrong. I'm dealing with the issue of a testing now. Job has done nothing wrong. Job was on his own. Okay? So this one, they say, trouble the, uh, 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 trouble the sleep, young go wake up. <laughs> you know, you are on your own. You are obeying the law. You haven't broken any law. You haven't offended anybody. You haven't stolen anybody's property. You haven't sinned. And all of a sudden, boom, things are different. And you begin to wonder, where did this come from? It's a testing of your faith. It's not about you. It's your faith. It's your faith. And it's a growth mechanism. For the children in our midst here, it's a process of growing and getting matured in God. So it is absolutely essential that our faith be tested and tried. And God allows that. So the trial and the testing of our faith, God allows it. So we can see that story of what happened to Job. So because Job was in that situation, his faith was being tested, his faith was being tried. Things were so bad that in Job chapter 2 verse 9, his wife said, enough is enough. Why not curse God and die? You're holding on to your integrity? He said, just let this thing go and die. But thank God, Job was strong in faith. And at the end of what happened to Job, we will see that his end was better than the beginning. He was a stronger man. He was a richer man. He had more children than all the children that died. He had more wealth than what he had, you know, at the beginning. Brothers and sisters, the trials and the temp trials of our faith, the testing of our faith, only makes us stronger. 
and better Christians. Praise the Lord. Because our faith is so precious to God, so we need faith to believe in Jesus as Savior. We need faith to receive from God. We need faith to give to God, whether it's our resources or whether it's our time. We need faith to please God. We need faith to obey the word of God. Because faith is very important, the Bible says, our faith will be tested and it will be tried. And the way we handle it will depend on where we will get to in terms of our growth. Okay. Now, let's briefly go on and look at, our, look at temptation. Temptation. James chapter 1, 13 to 15. It says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So we see the differences here. When you are being tested, it's nothing to do with you. No fault of yours. But with temptation, there is a pull. There is an attraction. There is something about a situation that you want to do it. You want to get it at all costs and by all means. And so because of that, everything but the reality, the truth of the word of God no longer makes sense to you. And why is that? Because temptation is from the enemy. God does not tempt. He allows our faith to be tried, but he doesn't tempt. Temptation comes from the enemy, and the purpose of temptation is to kill. It leads to death. The Bible says the thief come not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it in abundance. So temptation ultimately will lead to death. But there is a process. And that is why temptation is not something we play with. We don't hang around with it. Temptation for us as believers is for us to overcome it. We don't manage temptation. You overcome it. Because if you know that, look, this thing is going to kill me, this thing can result to my, and when I say kill, it can kill you spiritually, it can kill you physically. So it's so serious that it must be dealt with and dealt with appropriately and dealt with instantly by the word of God and true faith in the Holy Spirit. Okay? Okay? It is so. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. That is temptation. What is the mechanism of temptation? The process of temptation. That's the subject that we're going to be dealing with. Because it's dealing, our topic is dealing with temptation. I'd like to first of all read from Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We read that, to be tempted by who? The devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Who was hungry? Jesus. Jesus wanted something. He was hungry. He needed food. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on high, on the highest point of the mountain, of the, of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels charge, He will, will command his angel concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now, hear me clearly here. If you see what Satan has done here, he's quoted the scripture. We have been taught here several times to be careful of the dangers of incorrect scripture. That's what the, devil, the enemy does. He said there that he will command his angels concerning you Right? 
And then he went straight to, and they, and they will lift you up in their hand. But he skipped another phrase. The phrase that says, so that they will keep you in all your ways. He says, the Bible says, he commands his angel concerning you, so that they will keep you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So that phrase about you being in your way, the way of God, being kept in the way of God, Satan took that out. And that's the crux. That's the problem with temptation. When we are tempted, the devil wants to take us out of our ways, the way of God. He wants to take us out of the things that God wants us to do. He wants to take us clearly out of the instructions that God is giving to us. And in that moment, we must deal with it. That pull to pull us away, that attraction, that desperate, being, being, being desperate to get something at all costs, And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came to attend to him. So we see, we see there what I call the mechanism of temptation, the process of temptation. Temptation begins by the enemy coming to adulterate the word of God. When I say adulterate for the children in our midst, to bring impurities, to water down the word of God. Because the devil knows that once that word of God is watered down, we are no longer thinking straight. And we must never allow that. In the book of Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve, God gave clear instructions to Adam. And God said, of all the trees in the garden, all the trees, all, you may freely eat. He said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so you must not eat it. That was God's instruction. God didn't say you must not touch it, or he said you must not eat it. God didn't say the tree that is in the middle of the garden. God said of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat it. For on the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. That was God's clear instructions. Now when Satan came, we say when the serpent came to Eve, what was the first question? He says, did God say that of all the trees in the garden you may not eat? We see the adulteration of the word there. We see the pollution of the word. And then Eve now said, God did not say that, we, God, God did not say that, that, but God said that we may eat of all the trees, but the tree that is in the middle, God never said that. He said the tree that was in the middle of the garden, we must not eat. And we must not even touch it. So what Eve should have done then and then is rebuke Satan. Deal with it. But she didn't do that. But instead, she got involved in a dialogue with the serpent. So they started having a conversation. And before you knew it, 
Satan was able to convince Eve. So after all, no, 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 no. You're not going to die. That when you eat that tree, as a matter of fact, if you eat it, boom. Your eyes will be open. And straight away there, there was a leer. There was a leer. And then Eve was now glued. Wow. I like to have this experience. And my eyes will be open. And I can tell what is good. Like God. Ah, please give me this thing. And that was how she reached out and she ate it. So we see the, what we call the process of temptation. And of course, we all know the end story. The Bible says Adam and Eve, they died spiritually. They died spiritually because of yielding to temptation. And that is the reason why we must deal with temptation the moment it presents itself. The Bible tells us in the book of Thessalonians, we must flee from every appearances of what? Evil. Because temptation is evil, and temptation is of the devil, and temptation comes from the devil. The aim of temptation is to cause us to sin. And of course, we all know the soul that sin it, it shall do what? Death. Death. That's the aim of Satan. His aim is to separate from God. He doesn't care about physical death. That's, he's not interested in that. His aim is spiritual death, to cut that person off from God. Why? Because that is one thing that Satan can never have. Satan can never have a relationship where he'll be called the son of God or the child of God. He lost that privilege ages ago. And so that's the one thing he will want to take from any human being. That relationship with God, not physical death, For people listening to me, if you don't have that relationship with God, what I'm saying now may not make any sense to you. But the truth is, there is only one way to God. And that person is Jesus. He came to restore us to repair that dead relationship between Eve, Adam, and God, Jesus came to restore. And he died on the cross. He shed his blood for us, like we're going to be doing in a few minutes, taking communion. His body was broken for us, so that we can find a way back to God. Consider what Jesus has done. Because he did it for you, not for himself. He did it for you. Because he wants you back. To put you in that place, that relationship with him, which Satan can never have. Okay. So, as we continue with dealing with temptation, Psalm 119 verse 11. It says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart, so that I will not sin against you. we must soak ourselves in the word of God. Mark chapter 14, verse 38. Jesus said, we should do what? Wash and pray. Wash 
and pray so that you fall not into temptation. Genesis chapter 3, verse 2. When Eve had a conversation dealing daily with Satan, she gave the enemy a landing pad, what we call a foothold. We've been taught here so many times. A place just, you, you know when you see like washing butterflies flying in the garden, they just come and then they just perch on the flower. And if you don't disturb them after some time, you will see that gradually they begin to suck the nectar from that flower. It's a landing pad. It's a foothold. Don't give the enemy a foothold. Don't have any conversation with the enemy. If the thoughts come to you, if you begin to feel that strong pull, we counter it with the word of God. We rebuke it. We soak ourselves just fill yourselves with the word of God. Read the word of God. Read the Bible. Have faith in the Holy Spirit to take you through. And Romans chapter 6. 1 to 11, Romans chapter 6. He said, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means we are those who have died to sin. So because we have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? We have been liberated from sin. When you give your life to Christ, you have been liberated from sin. The Bible says, he that knew no sin became sin so that we, through him, might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So because we've given our lives to Christ, the moment you give your life to Christ, you've been liberated from sin. Sin has no power over you. Sin cannot overcome you. Sin cannot overcome me. Sin has no power over me. The power that sin has over a believer is the power that is given to sin by the believer. And so if we don't give sin a place in our lives, sin has no place in our lives. And so because of that, when the enemy comes and he tries to drag us into sin by bringing all these attractive things, all we have to do is Rebuke it in Jesus' name. Focus on the word of God. Wash and pray. Ask God to help you. If you feel that you are really struggling, go to God. Before you open your mouth, he knows, he sees it. He said, God, look, I'm really struggling with this, you know. Mention the thing. I'm really struggling with this temptation to steal this money, Mention it. Because if you mention it, there is an association. I'm really struggling with this temptation to, you know, change his signature and change the books. Mention it. Please help me. And when you make, say that type of prayer and mean it from your heart, God would help you. God will see you through. In Jesus' name. And we have to also remember that as we carry on on this journey with the Lord, let's ask him to constantly fill us with the Holy Spirit. Constantly fill us with the Holy Spirit. You can never be too filled with the Holy Spirit. You can never have too much of the Holy Spirit. Just ask him, Father, fill me. Father, fill me. Father, fill me. And God, who is faithful, would always fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. And the more the power of the Holy Spirit we have, the easier we can deal with temptation. 
as I round up. When you find yourself in a situation, an unpleasant situation as a believer, an unusual situation, the first thing you do Just think, how did I get here? How did I get into this situation? Had I do anything wrong? Did I try to cut corners? Once you've done all this self-analysis and you find that you haven't done anything it's just something that just has happened. Thank God and trust God for deliverance. Trust him to take you through. Trust him for grace. And God will take you through. And in the end, you will come out a more mature person, more patient person, complete in the things of God. But if you find, yes, there's something I did, clearly, a sin, you've done something which you shouldn't have done. It's not the end of the world. Ask God for forgiveness. The Bible says what? If we confess our sins before him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all forms of unrighteousness. And God will forgive, God will cleanse, God will deliver, and God will restore us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I thank you for listening. God bless you. Father, Lord, we thank and bless you for your word. Thank you, Lord, because you've spoken to us again. Lord, we want to deal with temptation in, from any angle, from outside, from inside us, Lord, thank you for clearly reminding us of what we should do. Lord, thank you, because your word says we should trust you with all our hearts and in all our ways, we acknowledge you, and you will direct our path. Help us to do this, Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for keeping us. Lord, thank you for directing us. You want us to succeed. You are in us, with us, for us, and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.